So the flip flops in prison go like this. When we go to the shower, we put our flip flops in a little gin bag with our, you know, cosmetics and everything else. And then we put our boots on. And when we get in the shower, then we take the boots off and put the flip flops on in the shower. And we got two homies standing outside the cell holding it down. So if something happens, you bang on the door, you know, the homie up and put your boots on and bring your down there. We're going to hold the door until you get your boots on. So you can't tell them, I ain't got my boots, dog. You know what I mean? Or you come run out the shower and flip flops and you sliding all over the place, getting getting crushed and getting them crushed where if you would have had your boots on and would have been suited and booted and ready for war. Because life is a war. Whether you're in prison or you're on the street. Get ready for an entertaining episode as we welcome our special guest and someone you've been asking for on this show, Wayne Hall, known as Unique. Unique's story is nothing short of thrilling, taking us from his rise as a New York City kingpin to his dramatic fall, resulting in a life in prison sentence. During his more than two decades in prison, Unique has gathered a wealth of knowledge and wisdom that he's now determined to use for the better. He's not just a YouTube content creator, but also the author of the gripping book, A Roar in Harlem, providing even more insight into his extraordinary journey. Be sure to check out the links in this episode description to connect with Unique on social media and explore his captivating book. This is an episode you really don't want to miss. This episode is brought to you by findagreatattorney.com. If you are injured anywhere in the country, visit findagreatattorney.com, a free service that can find you one of the best lawyers in your area. You focus on getting better and they'll do the rest. Huge, huge thank you to findagreatattorney.com for sponsoring this episode. Guys, I don't know if you know, but the other day there was a snowstorm in my hometown, Danbury, Connecticut, and I had left my car on the street thinking that it was okay to park there. I didn't get the notifications from the damp city of Danbury. They're not the best with social media. I gotta uh, say that about them, but I didn't get any notifications. I did sign up for their notification system going forward. I didn't know you had to remove your car from the street. And I thought that where I parked was okay because it wasn't the meters. And I was thinking that was a part to my building. Anyways, I wake up to an alert on my phone that my car got towed. There's like this app that connects to my car and it tells me. And that was at 5 a.m. Woke up at 8 a.m. to that news. I was so sick, man. That was devastating news. And what ends up happening is I, I couldn't get the car back the day of the storm after, which by the way, it wasn't really a storm. It was kind of a fluke. So they put this whole snow emergency together. Basically, um, there was like two or three inches max, Um, but it triggered the snow alert saying you had to get your cars off the street, yada, yada, yada. Couldn't get the car back that day because the place was closed. So I go in there the next day and I'm waiting in line. And one of the guys is, you know, like, a little bit giggling at me and he's like uh, they got your car uh, don't blast us out on social media I'm like uh, no it's not your fault guys uh, um, I have no quarrels with you no problem and then another guy comes out and I didn't know he was the owner but he says come outside and uh, he's like give me your keys what car is yours and I follow him and he brings me to the back of the lot where they keep the cars and he's like it's on us um, here you go and he gives me my car keys and another guy was graciously wiping off my car. And he didn't have to do that. This this gentleman, uh, this is Modulesky's uh, towing company on Federal Road in Danbury. He did not need to do that. This is probably the nicest thing someone in Danbury, a, a business owner has done for me um, in many years. And it's really nice to see that a great business guy. And it really means a lot to me and, and you know, if I need anything, car, auto body, whatever, I'm going to him because of that act of kindness he did today. And uh, I got to say, I'm going to re- recommend him to everyone I know because of what he did. So thank you again to Modulesky's towing service in Danbury, Connecticut for that act of kindness. And uh, that was my little story. I don't normally do this, but I really had to share the story, give you guys a little bit of faith in humanity because that really made my day and, and it went a long way. And, and um you know, the last week's kind of been hard, stressful, a lot of things work going on work related and that that made my day and then it made my year so far. So thank you again to them. And I hope you guys sit back, relax and get ready to lock in with Unique. Uh, uh, 
in. If you're talking and I want to say something about what you're saying, instead, because I don't do the cutting off. Yeah, I don't do I, that Yeah, either. I just do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if I'm saying something <laughs> and you want to speak on it, just put a finger up. And when I see your finger, then I know that, you know what I mean? Should I do that the whole episode? No, just just throughout the whole thing because they can't see you. No, don't put it up. Just on the low. I then I, no, then I'm gonna finish what I'm saying to know that you wanted to ask a question about it. I'm gonna say things that you might wanna follow up on, so we don't you know bump heads. It's just something I do when I record, so you yeah. don't have to do it. You're used to the unprofessional interviewers. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, because okay. dudes cut you off all the time. And you gotta let them know. Unique, man. Welcome to Locked In, bro. It is an honor. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you to Johnny Mitchell for connecting us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know if you saw, do you watch TikToks at all? Yeah. So mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, Johnny told your story mm -hmm. on my show from beginning to end. Yeah. I didn't interrupt him. Mm -hmm. That clip did like 4 million views. Get out of here. Sharing your story. Mm -hmm. And everyone was commenting. So half the comments were, I need you on the show, which mm -hmm. is great. It's like the universe said, Johnny, connect me. Mm -hmm. And number two, you know who people compare you to? Who? The unique in power. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. But have you heard that before? Yeah, because that's me all day. They already know it. You know what I mean. So I don't have to get on there and yell it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, the, the the dapper Dan Gucci jacket, the BMW from Harlem, the full open front gold teeth, the flat top, and of course they got Joey Badass that looked just like Unique back in the days. Come on, dog. I could put up pictures next to it, and you'd think that that was. You know, so we don't have to, you know. You know they killed him off in the last episode. Yeah, but I don't think they're going to be that dumb. They're probably going to have that he was really alive and, you know, somebody going to find him and he might be laid up with Rock somewhere trying to take care of him while his brother Kenny trying to kill Rock. You know how it is, man. It's movies. I love that you watch Power. That's you know? awesome. We used to watch, I was telling you the other day, we watched in the Fed joint. Uh, mm -hmm. We put on the on the USBs, the little SD cards. Yeah. Um, and we'd sneak them in when the guards weren't looking and watch it. You see, I was in a penitentiary. I didn't know what the hell a USB and an iPad and flip phone. I didn't know none of that. When I went in, we had the big G.I. Joe phones that got a battery pack that hang over your side. And the battery pack was really a motorcycle battery. <laughs> you know, that's the phones I left behind. So, and I didn't want none of that in there because of my status. If I would have had a cell phone and anything happened, they would have said that, you know, I tried to order head. I tried to sell a hundred keys. I tried to this and I couldn't fight it because what would I be doing with a cell phone? They can't believe that it would just be to call my, you know, my children and my family, you know. So that's why I didn't want none of that because I always was focused on getting out here. Yeah. So, Unique, you have this incredible story. Our listeners want to hear about it. They want to hear why you got to prison, mm -hmm. what your incredible story is. And then you have all these insane prison stories that you're building on your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you let us know what that channel is and uh, what people can expect, too. Yeah, Unique Mecca Audio um, at YouTube and, you know, Instagram. But, yeah, I, I do a lot of stories dealing with the prison because there's so many people covering, you know, the streets, prison, and that's what my channel's about. I talk about the streets, prison. I even give my perspective on entertainment news. You know, like the Cardi B offset, the the Diddy with Cassie, you know, uh, you know Kanye. I give my breakdown of it because I give the, the real breakdown of it. Not the social media, never left the porch, but got an opinion about something that you're not into. You know, because when you start getting money like, like these rappers is getting, that's the type of money we was getting then. Not there, but like, you know, we was getting that money, meaning everybody. So we entered into these things and had these scenarios that is playing out now because everything stays in the universe in what we call a cipher, which is a 360 degree circle. So nothing comes out. It just winds up hitting different people within the cipher at different times. It might be a hundred years later. When you catch a cold, somebody else is going to catch a cold. You know, they might catch it later. Go ahead. That was a great analogy. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was listening. You, you've been sending me some of your clips, and you have some great takes that I think the audience would love to hear your perspective on by checking out your YouTube channel, too. Mm -hmm. And now you're getting on TikTok. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're going to be seeing your, I got some competition. <laughs> yeah, nah, see, that's what I'm saying. I'm glad you said that so you understand, because that's what I call the YouTube rat bastards and flip-flop wearing in public trolls. It's never competition. Yeah. It's just stepping your game up. You understand what I'm saying? And it, 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 you, you got 200-something thousand subscribers, so you invite me on, you share those subscribers with me. I got a little 70,000, you know, 
I want to get to 100,000, I reach out to you, Johnny Mitchell, Chad Marks, you know what I mean? Uh, um, my man Eon from DC Blacks, you know, uh, you know, uh, what is Zeke Black, you know, I got Bootsy from Street Knowledge. So I open my door and my platform to help my brothers get big because if they get bigger than me, then I could go to them for a favor. I don't want to be the only one on the top. Just like hustling back in the days when we was on the street, I don't want to be the only one selling 20 keys a day. You know, I want you to, I want to help you to be able to sell 40 keys a day. That way, if I need 20 keys, I can say, yo, I'm short today. Let me get 20 keys. I don't want to be, when I need something, there's nobody to turn to because I'm busy trying to, you know, be in competition with everybody, be above this. Nah, ain't none of that. I'm comfortable and satisfied with what I have, and I want everybody to eat off of my plate because the plate is big enough. When they come to YouTube, they don't just come to uh, uh, locked in with Ian Bick. They don't just go to, you know, Johnny Mitchell. They don't just go to DC Black. They don't just go to Street Knowledge Podcast, you know? They watch that, and then they find something else to watch, and then they find something else to watch, like Netflix. So people get it confused on YouTube to think that, you know, they need to be in competition when it's not about competition. You know what I mean? It's about working together because it's enough money for everybody. So if I'm going to think that, I want to be the only one selling 20 keys, you know, in, 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 you know, in, in my neighborhood, you know, 20 keys is nothing, you know? So there's enough room for everybody to sell 20 keys. It's like there's enough room for everybody to get 100,000 views and mm -hmm. subscribers. And that's how I look at it. So it's never competition. That's why, I, you know, I look out for people. I bring them on my show and I shout out other people platforms that you just see I did because that's what it's about. When I eat, you eat. You know what I mean? And, you know, I'm, I'm going to even give you something because we ride, you know? So you understand. You know, that, that's what I do at Unique Mecca Audio. I, I ride, man. So when I change topics, it's called riding. That's like when I was riding up here, you know, I might listen to one radio station and get bored with that, put it on another radio station. Might listen to this USB, take it out and put it in another one. That's called riding. So now, you know, it's like when a person has beef, you understand? Whether it, they on the street or they're civilian, YouTube or whoever, when they got beef, they run to their comrades. I got beef. I got beef. You know what I mean? And now their comrade go bring out their guns, their knives, their fists, whatever they choose to fight with. You know what I mean? Or make a YouTube video to support them. But then now, here they go. They winds up getting 100,000 subscribers, and now they're getting 100,000 views a day, and they making all this money. And then they don't go tell their comrades, yo, come get on my platform. I got 100,000 views and subscribers. You know what I mean? But they'll say, hey, I got a beef. Come help me with the beef. So the whole thing is you don't just want somebody to help you when, when you have a problem. You're supposed to be there for them when you have an abundance as well. That's what we call in the hood from Harlem breaking bread. You know, we break bread. I love that. And that's something I've learned as I got older because I'm a lot younger than you. Mm -hmm. And I realized it's not always about cashing in on a favor in the moment mm -hmm. or getting an exchange. Like so many people are like, oh, I need like this money right now for this. There could be something, no, I got you, here you go. Mm -hmm. And then if the time arises where you could do something for me, I'll reach out. Mm -hmm. And if you don't help me, then you kind of show that that person's true colors. Exactly. And that's why you never give nobody nothing that you can't stand to lose. You know what I mean? In other words, I'm not going to lend you $100 or $1,000 or 100000 if I can't stand to lose it. That way I don't be in a position to have to make that money, what we call in the street, the principle of the thing. Because do you know what the principle is? Do you know what the word principle mean when we use that on the street? What's your definition? My definition of principle? Yes. I mean, who? I guess your word, right? Like what, 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 what you're standing by, what your morals are, uh, what you believe in as a man. Exactly. But when you say principle, you're 100% right. But I'm going to give them an analogy of when I say principle. Principle is, you know, you got all this going on with the YouTube. You know what I mean? And then somebody owes you $10 because they borrowed $10 to go to McDonald's and say they're going to give it back to you. And then now you go ask them for your money. They say, man, screw you. You got a YouTube channel. You don't need that $10. Be like, nah, you gave me your word. You don't give me my money back and I want my money back. You know what I mean? And then now you get in a fight. You wind up shooting them, kill them, stab them or whatever. Now you're in, Prince, in jail and then you're going to say, you know, to my ex, yo, why did you do it? You got the YouTube and everything going on. Man, it was the principal of the thing. He tried to diss me. So many people lost their lives for the principle. Yeah. You know what I mean? So do you believe in the principle then? Or are you against the principle now that you're older? Because no, I'm not, sure the young yeah, unique not, thought of it differently. Exactly. Because the young unique was coming up, making a stance, and I dealt with a lot of things from ignorance and being blinded. You know what I mean? And your, 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 your morals, your principles, your word, your honor, your respect, you die for that. 
You know what I mean? When you're on the street, you die for that. Because if you show any weakness towards any one of that, then you're going to have a problem. You understand? Because now you're going to have the wolves coming out and they're going to smell blood. You know what I mean? Just like, you know, just, just like you, you, you bring a you bring a stripper into a visiting hall and the nigga smell pussy. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So if a nigga weak and, you know, he letting people take from him and say, man, I ain't worrying about that. It's only $10. Another person's going to look back at it and say, man, that nigga soft. That nigga pussy. You know what I mean? I smell pussy. I'm going to get that nigga. And then now you got to deal with more problems than that. You know what I mean? And that's how people, what we call self-created drama. You know, self-created drama is dealing with 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 bammers, you know, with, with, with suckers, you know, that don't honor and respect the code. Because, see, my thing is, it ain't about it ain't about uh, uh, where you from. It ain't about what color you are. Like we was talking about John Gotti out there with the hockey young Adrian man. Adrian Galante. Yeah. Adrian Galante. Yeah. You know, good dude. I just met him, you know, and thank you. But we just talking about John Gotti. See, John Gotti is respected because, you know. He didn't see color. You two yell, he's racist, he's racist. No, he's not racist. He's proud to be an Italian. You know what I mean? Like, we're proud to be black. We're proud to be from Harlem. We're proud to be from Chicago. You know, they're proud to be, you know, from El Salvador. You know, it's just pride, you know, and that's where it's at. But people confuse pride with racism. You know what I mean? But everybody's supposed to feel that they're better than the next, but know that we all equal and capable of accomplishing the same thing. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, so, you know, that's where I'm at with it, man. Um, I, I, I'm not with, with none of that. It's just all out of, out, out of respect, man. So I keep my circle small and, you know, know who I deal with. And if somebody violates something in that circle, you know, I just push back from them so I don't have to kill them. You know, so I don't have to do nothing on the principle of the thing. So I know how to eliminate putting myself in a situation to have to defend the principle. Because sometimes you still have to defend the principle. Because if a dude take you for soft and, you know, that's going to lead to him trying you or your family or your loved ones, then you have to deal with it. And that's why on the streets we know to check things as they happen, not after they happen. You know, like you get in an argument. If somebody do something to disrespect you and you keep it in, even if it's your best friend and you keep it in and you wait two, three days a week later and then you bring it up to him. Now he don't know what he did. You know what I mean? And then when he do it again, now in your mind he disrespected you. But you never told him a week ago, two days ago, three days ago that that was a disrespect. You know what I mean? So if you don't check him, so in the street somebody do something, you check him right there. Hold on, Slim, we don't do that. You know what I mean? Now, you know, you, you violate now. Don't tell me three days later that I said something you didn't like because we're from different geographical locations. Look, we just downstairs in the deli here where you was at. The dude, I told him I wanted a meatball sandwich. The dude t said a grinder. So I'm thinking, that, damn, what are you selling dope upstairs? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> what are you trying to do, cut up some dope or something? You know, but then he just told me that a grinder is a sandwich. Yeah. You understand? But then now, if let's say this in my neighborhood and somebody asks me if I want a grinder, I'm going to be ready to go in his mouth because now you invite me to go back to drugs to risk losing my freedom again. So those are fighting words. Somebody offer you cocaine, heroin. You understand what I'm saying? Or, and, you know, anything of that manner that you know could land you back, you know, where you're not trying to go. Now that's a total disrespect. You know what I mean? But I know where I'm at. So I asked you, what did he mean by grinder? Because I'm thinking, man, who am I? You pulled wanna, me to the side. You know, like, like he, yeah, like he thinking, that, yeah, I pulled him to the side and asked him, yo, what's up with this? Because dude, I'm talking about, you know, I said, give me a meatball siren. And you know what I mean? He talking about, uh, uh, oh, you want a grinder? So I'm thinking that he thinking that I'm the connect. And I done brought the dope up here. We get ready to go upstairs and cut up some dope and, you know, use the grinder or something. But that's where my mentality is at because I done been around so much. But I know that I can't put, you know, my, my mentality, my understanding into everyone else because that's why it's different geographical locations. And that's why the Bible and the Torah and the Quran is, is translated. You know what I mean? So it could be understanding dif in different languages, but it's still the same word. Mm. You know? Now, the way you just broke this all down for me, right? Mm -hmm. If someone had done that for you when you were a kid, do you think your life would have been different? Like it would have turned out differently? If someone had done what? Broken this down on the acting on principle and oh, the yeah. triggers. Oh, yeah, most, and, most and, definite. Because, you know, when I was growing up, it, 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 if somebody came and, 
I gave him a, a, we used to sell three dollar bags of weed. You know what I mean? You know, I'm talking about when I was like 10, 11 years old. We said three dollar bag of weed and you know dollar joint. So if somebody come and they say, man, let me get a three dollar bag until Friday when I get paid. You know, now you give it to him and then Friday, he don't come to you no more. But then you on another block that they sell three dollar bags of weed and you see him over there copping, but he owes you three dollars. Now I'm going to bust him in his head because he's trying to play me. He done owe me three dollars. Now he don't want to come pay me. So he don't come back on my block, but he bringing the money over there so he can get him comfortable enough to give him a five dollar bag on credit. You understand what I'm saying? So he can run off with his and then go to the next block. And you got creeps that do that. You know what I mean? And yeah, and I was told from back then, if a dude owe you a dollar, you take it from him and you take it hard and you make sure he know what it is. Wow. Where'd you grow up? What was like your family like, your childhood? My child, I was born in Jamaica in Kingston and uh, came up in 1972 when I was seven, um, going on eight. You know, I came up January 15th, 1972. I was um, born in 1964. So I was seven and a half. My birthday was in six months when I came up here. You know, my family first went to New Jersey, but that's because, you know, my mother was in a car accident, had a little money, and then she saved up some money and they bought a house in Jersey. So I wound up there. But all my family and friends from Jamaica that came up to the States was in Brooklyn, Miami, you know, so, you know, uh, the Bronx. So, you know, I used to go over there on the weekends just to spend time with my family and friends. But when I go over there, the ones that was of age was hustling. You know, they were selling weed, you know, if they was rosters. And that's where I learned from really selling the weed. And then by the time 78, 79 came in, you know, that's when the powder cocaine started getting big and they were selling heroin and the cocaine with the speedball, mixing it in. So I learned how to sell the weed before I was 14, learned how to cut up heroin. That's why when I hit grinders, stick in my head. You know what I mean? We going to grind the dope up, you know? So... You know, I was raised in in, in, in in the boroughs and down in Miami because my cousins, you know, C.P. Cox from Trunk Funk Cox, C.P. down there doing his thing. You know, this is my blood cousins, my mother's sister's um, brothers, uh, I mean, sons. So I used to go down in Miami. That's how I learned about the Miami bass music. That's how I learned about Luke Skywalker. That's how I learned about the 808, you know, and I learned a whole nother world from being in Miami. And then when I started getting money, because I'm riding right now, I'm riding, you know. So you asked about childhood, but it slipped over that my childhood started down there in Miami. And from going down there and knowing my way around and going to the Pack Jam, people in Miami know what it is. I just gave Miami a big shout out. Pack Jam, Strawberries, Rolex before it was a strip club. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, Big Daddies. You know, these are all spots back in, in, the, in the 80s, you know, early 80s. It's before the crack. And, and uh, cause it, when, when Rolex now is a big strip club, back then it was just a disco. That's what they called it. They didn't even just call it club. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they didn't have no rap music out like that or nothing. Because remember, I was there from like 77, you know, when, you know, they first played Rapper's Delight. I grew up in Jersey with Leland Robinson, you know, and, you know, Sylvia Robinson and all them. So I learned about music from being around them. And when I went to Miami and I saw how, um, like in 88, they still playing the Rapper's Delight and Big Daddy Kane, you know what I mean? You know, stuff that was older. You understand what I'm saying? Scott LaRock, you, you know what I'm saying? They playing old songs down there, Good Times, you know, Chic. They playing all these old stuff down there because Miami, and it's no disrespect to them, it's just the facts. By the time the music got from New York to Miami, it might be five, eight years later before it get there, just like by the time the music, and people don't even think about it, that's why I open their mind up, that's why they don't understand how powerful these phones are, you know, that I came home and was blessed to be able to see and experience as a free man. When you over in like uh, Germany, you know, um, England, when you over in Japan, China, you know, even Russia, they don't get American music until decades later. So these rappers forever make money. Even they're not playing these old rappers, you know, brand new being big shout out to them, you know, Sadat, Drez, Alamo, the whole crew, Lord Jamal, you know, even though they're not playing them up here in America, in these other countries, they're playing them and they could actually book a concert 40 years later and they just as big in those countries as they was in America 40 years ago because it took time for it to get from there to there. So what people don't understand is they're blessed to have this social media. They wouldn't be nothing without this phone and social media. 
because you got to remember, I made my name, my comrade, you know, um, Lou Sims from the Lynch Mob and, you know what I mean, and, and Peter Shu and Kevin Childs. We made our name without social media. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We made it from word of mouth. We set the trend for the fashion we wear, the slang we use, the cars we drive. Look at like you mentioned about, you know, um, uh, 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 Kanan. You understand what I'm saying? They went all the way back to grab, grab my character from back then to put him in the movie. Just like they're going to grab my comrades' characters and put them in the movies. That's what they do. You know what I mean? So, But they don't want to pay us. You know, so they figure that, you know, they just make it close as they can to it and just try and get over. But, you know, that's what it is, man. Do you think music inspired your pathway? To, oh, most, to... most definitely. Because I grew up in Jamaica when they had dub plates, you know, when rap wasn't even in America. But the, in Jamaica, you had Brigadier Jerry, uh, uh, Yellow Man, Ika Mouse. You know what I mean? These was our first rappers back then. Bob Marley even was rapping. You understand when he was chanting, you know, so it started from down there. And that's why the pioneers of hip hop right now, the pioneers right now, um, Cool Herc, you know what I mean, that they give it to. And, you know, Grandmaster Flash and Theodore, they all Jamaican. They all Jamaican. All the pioneers, look them up. You know what I mean? They all Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. And they learned it from the Jamaicans using two records and a turntable and making the dub plates with the chants. And, you know, they got that from Jamaica. You understand? Because that's what we grew up as. Where in Jamaica, they was already doing the block parties and, the, you know, playing the music outside. Then in, in New York, over there on Cedar Ave, they started opening up the bottom of the the light pole and, you know, hooking the, 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 the power up to it to bring the, the speakers and stuff out. And in Jamaica, it's like, who had the biggest sound system? Who had the biggest speakers? You know, like when I went to Jamaica, like 91, the the this day, day I think it was Act, 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 Act 2, you know, they had, the music was so powerful, you know, the bass that you look and on the ground, you'll see the red clay from the ground would look like smoke in the sky all the way up to your knee from the bass rumbling it. And it's so hot down there and it's dry. So the the, the dust, you'd be up, by the time you leave there, you're wearing shorts, your whole leg dirty. You got to go home and wash your leg, you know? But yeah, most definitely I, that influenced my life to answer your question. Like I said, I'm riding, dog. I'm giving you a blessing. I'm riding. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, yeah, it definitely influenced my life because I was there, you know, at the Ecstasy Garage, the Tea Connection, the Stardust Ballroom, Office Round Table, Harlem World, Celebrity Club. These are all spots in the 70s that I'm naming, in the 70s. This is when I was a kid. You know, just like, you know, they just had, uh, they had, what was that, like Studio 54, Plato's Retreat. That's what they had. It was like big discos back then. And then these are the spots that we had for us in the hood. Savoy Manor, you know, in the Bronx and Harlem and, you know what I mean? And then, you know, you, uh, what's the joint over there at Queen? The Q Club was jumping and, you know, things like that. But yes, music definitely influenced my life because it saved a lot of people's lives because they say music calmed the savage beast. So plenty of times I was ready to go to war and I heard certain songs and I just vibed out to it and it kind of calmed my spirit, you know? I have to interrupt this interview to tell you guys about Find a Great Attorney. It's a service revolutionizing the way injured parties find one of the best personal injury attorneys in their area. I've known the founder, Richard Hastings, for a long time and I have to say I'm impressed with his abilities as a lawyer and how much he really cares about his clients. And that's something it's hard to find nowadays. Accidents can happen to anyone, leaving you not knowing what to do or where to turn. Most people don't know how to go about finding a top-rated lawyer. Findagreatattorney.com can connect you to one of the best lawyers in your area. Have peace of mind knowing you're in the hands of a lawyer that can help maximize the amount of money you can get for your case. Findagreatattorney.com relieves the aggravation of finding a highly regarded attorney for any type of accident case in any state. All you need to do is fill out their brief online form and they could get back to work finding you a highly rated lawyer in your area. The best part is there's no cost for their service and the lawyers they refer you to only get paid if they win your case. Yeah, you heard that right, folks. A free lawyer. You don't have to come up with any money out of your own pocket to hire one of the best attorneys in your area. Don't take a chance and hire a lawyer that will not properly represent you. Visit findagreatattorney.com fill out their brief online form, and let them do the rest. The strength of your lawyer might very well determine how much money you are able to get for your case. Now let's get back into my interview with the one, the only, unique. Yeah. Now, but 
what the music itself, right? Was it was it the money that was of interest? Like what, what led from the music translating into the life you chose? Is what I'm curious about. Nah, it was never about the money. The music was because it was it was in my soul. Okay, you know what I mean. It was in my soul, so it wasn't about the money. You know, with music because there was no money in music. You understand what I'm saying? Back then, the rappers wasn't even getting paid. They ain't getting paid nothing now. They're becoming millionaires, but look what the companies is getting over them. The company's not even giving them no health insurance. They still, the company still get money from a rapper from 50, from, from, from 40 years ago. You know what I mean? From, you know, from in the 80s, the 70s, they still making money from these artists. You know what I mean? Some of these artists been on their labels for that long, but they don't get no pension from them. You understand? So they just use them for their money and then everything goes. So they ain't got to pay no pension. They ain't got to pay no nothing. They just take the money from them and they eat off them forever. And then when they get of age, if they don't make another record, now they got to go get a job at the local subways or the diner downstairs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's not like what it is now where it looks like they're making all of this money. That wasn't it for you back then. No, nah, but the, the money that they, if I want you to understand, the money that they're making now that is a lot of money to us, is nothing compared to what they're pulling in themselves. They're giving them not even crumbs off the table. You know what I mean? What they paying these rappers with 20 big chains on and the rings. They got $100 million when the company done made billions. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? But they don't think of that. All they do is look at the facade that, you know, it's like when I was a kid, my older brother uh, used to say, man, I got to put you in a store. Cause you don't want to sit in an apartment. I used to work behind a door where we had steel and the cylinder cut out and they ring the doorbell. You drop the cylinder on a rubber band and you push the weed through the door and they push the money back and you hidden behind the door, you know, but I would want to put on my chains and get dressed up and, you know, go in front of the building. My brother's like, man, don't go down there. Got them Americans going to try and rob you. Da, da, man, I got my nine millimeter. I ain't worrying about nothing. Da, 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 da. And he's like, man, okay. So you like the limelight. Like, we got to get you a store with a bulletproof glass. So you could just sit in the store behind this bulletproof proof glass sell my weed all day and just be the monkey in the window <laughs> you know what I mean that's how he was telling me to, 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 to disrespect me so he understand that me wanting to be in the limelight wasn't where to be you know what I mean so he said I get your store so he went and got a store and I sat behind the window just like this and all the Americans came in I got my chains my jewels my watch on I'm doing me and they coming in buying the weed and I'm sitting there and I'm handing them over all the money and I'm getting two three hundred dollars a week so you realize you didn't want to be that guy that was just the broken off one getting the crumbs. Yeah, that that monkey in the mirror. You wanted the whole crumb cake. I wanted the whole crumb cake. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So that's what it was for you. And that's what it was because I watched how the people that I was working for and I'm loyal to, I'm giving them their money, you know, because it's theirs. You understand? But at the same time, I'm not getting nothing. But at what they was giving me at that time was a lot. But it really wasn't nothing. But I didn't know that it wasn't nothing. It was a lot then, but as time went on and I started really learning the bill, I'm like, damn, I just sat here and cut up 10 pounds of weed. You know what I mean? I done brought in eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a night. You understand? To give to this man, you know? In, in five days, I gave him $40,000. And in five days, he gave me $200 out of that. But I was a kid. $200 was a lot. I go buy me some Adidas, some Pumas, some mock necks, some, you, you know what I mean? Some overlap pants and Calvin Klein. I could go do me with 200 But I gave him 40000 But things moving so fast and you're so loyal, you don't even pay attention until it's too late. You know what I mean? So when I went to jail the first time, I had time to sit back and think. I said, damn, I gave him all this money where my brother to retire, moved down to Texas. The other dude moved down to Miami. Everybody moved out and I'm sitting in jail and I'm going home to nothing and they got a whole family out there. You saw the bigger picture. Quick. So you know? do you, look, knowing what you know now and uh, you're way, you're well-educated now compared to where, when you were back then, mm-hmm. do you consider yourself an entrepreneur, like at heart? Do you I've, think always, you were? I've always been, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because just like I came out of jail after 26 years, I didn't go run and knock at Walmarts or McDonald's or nowhere to ask for a job. I created my own lane, which is my YouTube channel, Unique Mecca Audio. I created my own lane. That's being an entrepreneur. 
I don't have to go to nobody and say, I need a check every two weeks or every week to pay my bills. I know how to create money. I know how to generate money. I know how to attract money. I'm attracting money for you right now doing this interview. Just like we had that conversation so you understand. I know when you drop this video, however you drop it, parts, whatever, when you put it up, it's like you said, you got like two, three million views off the John Johnny Mitchell did. I know you make money off of that, but I want you to make money off of that. All I want you to do is help me get money. Help get me out there. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm cool with that conversation. You understand? I'm not going to tell you, oh, you made $3 million, so that means you made uh, X amount of dollars, so you owe me 10%. That's what suckers do. Whatever you make with your lane, that's yours. Help me get a lane. Yeah. And that's what life is about. But everybody want to watch the next man's pocket. If you figure out a way to get me on your channel to get 3 million views and get 30,000, 10,000, 3,000, whatever you got off it, because you know these rat bastards and flip-flop wearing and public trolls, they're going to say, oh, he said he made this amount off it, but YouTube only pay you this. And then they try and deviate from the jewels that I'm giving you. So that's why I can't stand a rat bastard. You know what I mean? Because all they do is, you know, they they look for any little thing to try and nitpick at to take you away from the main jewel that's there. So if we arguing over, you know, we going back and forth or the two viewers, they say sitting in their living room and they say, oh, he just said that he made 30000 off a $3 million clip. He don't make that. But then now you don't miss the whole entrepreneurial conversation. And that's what trolls and flip-flop win and public rat bastards do that's why they wear the flip-flops in public because they're just moving through life like a zombie like a walking dead because how could you defend yourself or even get out the way of a car that might just you know try to go around some garbage while you're crossing the street and you're in the middle and somebody tried to go around the garbage and now that car is coming towards you total accident don't mean that nobody's shooting or nothing and then now they try and pivot to get out the way. They got their flip-flop. They fall down, you know what I mean? Twist their ankle and now the car run over them. You know? Or somebody just starts shooting. Because we know there's a lot of shooting going on. Somebody starts shooting and here's a grown man walking with his woman with flip-flops on. That's the most disrespectful thing you could ever do to your woman is be out there in flip-flops. When you're supposed to be out there making money to bring home to your woman and make and out there taking care of your woman and protecting your woman while you're out in public. But yet you with your woman wearing flip-flops. You can't defend yourself. You can't d d defend your woman. You, you know, so what is your purpose? You know what I mean? You're just like a zombie, man. You know, just get out the way. You know what I mean? You know, the first clip I ever saw of you earlier this year when I started YouTube yeah. was your rant about the flip-flops. Yeah, because I hate them. Yeah, why do you not <laughs> like hip flip-flops? So You don't even wear them to the beach, nah. right? Like nothing. Nah. Why, what is that? <laughs> because I'm always, I'm always ready to protect myself. And my father and my mother both told me, once you walk out that door, make sure you have all the tools to survive. If you're going out there to work, to go get a job or whatever, go get your education. Go get your books. Go get your pencils. If you're going out there to hustle, go get your pistol. Go get your bullets. And you know what I mean? Where you can protect yourself. You understand? Now, how are you going to protect yourself with flip-flops? I mean, for real. And they say, you know, all oh, unique, you've been gone 30 years. You know what I mean? It ain't violent out there no more. Look at the news. Look at TikTok. I watched the TikTok coming out here where a dude pulled out a big AR-15 out the car and another dude got a handgun. And the two of them is running around the car when they both had a chance to walk away. The two of them is running around one car like you playing telly. You trying to catch somebody running on the car, but they firing bullets. One got an AR-15. What would possess this dude with the handgun to stay when the dude went in the car to get the gun, bust your gun at him, you, you hit him, you hit him. If you miss, you get the hell out of Dodge because you know he got way more bullets than your little handgun. So you got to know how to weigh your options, but you can't defend yourself in flip-flops, man. You can't do it. You know that. Mm -hmm. You see dudes get body slammed all on YouTube and TikTok wearing flip-flops. So while we're on this topic of flip-flops, can you can compare that to the penitentiary with the flip-flops and the showers and the boots? Because that me as a little white kid going into prison, yeah. you know me, I was marching my white ass down the flip-flops. No, no, no. We don't do none of that. Listen, man, when you're in the prison, right, it's the same thing as on the street. And if I pay by, I say, oh, you Nick, you're not in jail no more. Yo, listen, I'm going to give you a whole nother analogy because I fucks with you, right? This world is a prison. 
You understand? You got people like you live up here in Danbury. You in a prison in Danbury. You got a routine. You get up every morning. You wash your face, brush your teeth, get your food, and you come down here to the studio. You get on your computer. You get on your phone, and you conduct your business. You do what you got to do, and then you go home. Your, your woman cook you meal, or you make your meal, and you watch your little YouTube or your, your Netflix, whatever you want to watch, and then you go to sleep and wake up to do it again. But you're not going nowhere further than from your house to here and wherever you go to get the food you need and the nutrients that you need for what and that's it so you put yourself in a self-made prison it's just there's no bars there no physical bars but I see the bars in my mind when I'm just leaving from from uh, uh, 155th street to 110th street to stay in the box of Harlem I'm in a prison in Harlem there's so many people in a prison in the Bronx in Brooklyn in, in, in Japan wherever because they find a routine to go from point A to point B to make money and then back to point C to go lay down and get up to do it all over again. That's a prison. But that's self-incarceration. Then they have physical incarceration. Physical incarceration is when, you know, you, you, you a black man making money in America. This was back in the 80s. You know, I won't speak about now. But back in the 80s, you got a black man making money. And here it is. I walk in a dealer and I see a Mercedes and I said, yo, let me use the phone, you know? And they be like, nah, yo, here go G, let me use the phone. I call my brother, yo, I feel like driving two Mercedes this weekend. What color you want? You know what I mean? And I go grab two shoeboxes and buy two Mercedes. You understand? Yeah. And didn't have to pay tax on it. Didn't have to pay tax on the money. So the government is like, whoa, we're not getting none out of that. So we need to get them off the street. Because they're not trying to pay their dues. But once you pay your taxes, they had no problem with how much drugs you sell until a murder occurs. Now when you're talking about taking a civilian's life or even another drug dealer's life, because you can miss the drug dealer and hit an innocent child, adult, or whatever on the street. You understand? So they said, now we got to get him off the street because now he's bringing violence in it. But if you, if you was paying your taxes back then, you know, you ain't had to worry about no feds coming in until violence come. And everybody watching this, and I'm going to say everybody that's from that era that know what time it was, they know how they went down. We didn't go down until violence came around us, you know, but the, but the flip-flops in prison, I don't forget none because that's how I ride. I'm just riding for you today. I like you that. You know what I mean? I, I now, fuck with that. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. Just let me ride, man. I just put a different tape in. I'm giving in. you your space, man. No, I, I got know you. you all. Yeah. No, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the viewers. You are excellent because you let me ride. That's why you get the classic to. interview. Yeah. You know, people call you on their thing, they interview, and then they want to show they know as much as you and they know what you say, <laughs> just sit back and enjoy the ride. I love man. this. I'm a jo I should have had a beer for myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, so the flip flops in prison go like this. A dude goes and he's wearing his flip flops. He's going in the shower. Now, when he go in the shower, he got his flips off on, flip flops on. He come out the shower and his homeboy is in a fight. You understand what I'm saying? And then now somebody see him. They run up on him. When they run up on him, they run in to put that knife in him. And he got on flip-flops sliding all over the place. Got to get out the flip-flops and try and fight, you know, with, with, with flip-flops on. When all you got to do is step on his toes and stab him in his face. You know? So if you can't defend yourself in flip-flops, then you definitely can't be on the compound around me in no flip-flops. Because we need to defend each other. Because it's us against them. What if the Serenos move on us? What if the GDs move on? What if the Bloods move on? The Crips move on? And you sitting there with flip-flops on. How are you going to get balance and stability on the floor to fight? When we go to the shower, even we go to the shower, we put our flip-flops in a little gin bag with our, you know, cosmetics and everything else. And then we put our boots on. And when we get in the shower, then we take the boots off and put the flip-flops on in the shower. And we got two homies standing outside the cell holding it down. So if something happened, nigga, bang on the door. You know, the hurry up and put your damn boots on and bring your ass down there. We going to hold the door until you get your boots on. So you can't tell them, I ain't got my boots, dog. You know what I mean? Or you come run out the shower in flip-flops and you sliding all over the place getting, getting crushed and getting them crushed. Where if you would have had your boots on and would have been suited and booted and ready for war. Because life is a war, whether you're in prison or you're on the street. It's incredible. This is why people are so fascinated by this. Because all this is survival, my nigga. Mm -hmm. This is survival. You have to be on point to survive at all times. Going in the street mm -hmm. with flip-flops, that's not being on point. Mm -hmm. 
You understand? They think, oh, I'm out here. The police gonna protect me. The police didn't protect the dude when they was doing shooting the AK, uh, the AR-15, chasing dude around. The thing with a handgun and the straight bullets going everywhere while they shooting big bullets right here in St. Louis is where it was at. You understand what I'm saying? So don't sit there and tell me, oh, you Nick, you bugging, you been locked up a long time. It ain't like that no more. No, they still got killers. They still got lunatics. You still got mental illness in society, in any society. So you got to know that at, at one time, God might allow, you know, the devil to allow one of his minions to cross your path. And you have to be able to defend yourself and protect yourself and the loved ones that you with. You see on the news every day. All day. But they're quick to tell me when I first came on, oh, you need, you're paranoid. I'm sitting in the car parked at the corner and I'm talking to, you know, a young lady in the car and a dude is walking across the street, but he's walking right towards me and he got a full mask on. So now I'm reaching. And she's like, yo, what are you doing? I'm like, yo, you don't see that dude? Man, he's just crossing the street. No, and what would stop him from putting a gun in my face? Oh, it ain't like that no more. You bugging, it's safe. Nah. You know what I mean? You keep believing that. And here it is three years later. Now she done went out and got caught up, carjacked, da 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 So now she see what I'm saying. And it's no longer that I'm, you know, bugging. But go ahead. So how does a, a young kid like yourself go from the guy that was getting the crumbs to going, getting sentenced to, you know, life in prison under kingpin charges? How does that happen? Because it's like uh, I went to jail in uh, from 85 to 87, came out of 87 and, you know, went to Harlem and I started doing my own thing. At this time, my brother and all my comrades that raised me because they older than me. I said I was, you know, 11, 12, 13. I was a kid. All of them now, they don't got caught up by the feds, got deported, got, you know, doing life in jail. I know a dude that's locked up now for decapitation. I know three dudes locked up for decapitation and not for the same hit. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But this is the era that I come out of. So it was like, you know, the people that I looked up to, that I was loyal to and soldiers for, you know, now they all gone. And now I had to do my own thing. And I didn't even realize it, that they was preparing me for that moment without them even knowing they preparing me for that moment. So same way I told you, I used to bag up 10 pounds of weed, you know what I mean? And, you know, bag up eight pounds and, you know, give them 5,000 off for each pound. They done got 40,000 but I know how to bag it up. I know how to do everything. I'm running the house. I'm doing this, but I'm getting $200 a, a week. You understand? But then now when I came out 87, the ones that I was loyal to that was using me, now they're long, no longer here, but I don't look at it like they was using me because the game is to be sold, not told. You understand? So they were selling me the game. So I was working and I was getting compensated the game, the knowledge of the game, the knowledge of the entrepreneurship is what I got for working in those herb gates. So when my turn came, when they was no longer there, now it's all different now. Now I got to go bag up the weed, cut up the weed, but I'm getting the 40000 You understand what I'm saying? And then it went over the coke and, you know, when, it, when the, the, the crack hit, it was like ridiculous because, you know, in, 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 it, it was at least one in every household that got high back then. That's how bad it was with crack. At least one in every household was getting high. You understand? So we in a building, like where I'm from, it's called the Polo Grounds. You know what I mean? Let's call it Lincoln Project. It's a, you know, a, a, a grand project, you know, Harlem. When we talking about these places, we talking about apartment buildings. Like the Polo Grounds got 30 floors and it got four buildings. You know what I mean? And it got like 3,500 families, 2,500 families in there. You know? And one out of everyone is getting high. And majority of them, most of them was getting high. And then here they go coming down the stairs to spend their money. So you could go on any block to make money. Grant Projects, 25th Street, 14th Street, the, the Bronx over on Bathgate, on Valentine, wherever you go. But it's different drugs of choice wherever you go. So, you know, once I seen what was going on and I came home, I went up the hill. The first thing I spent when I came home, I came home with $366. I put $100 on a two-finger name ring to go on these two fingers. And then I went downtown and I bought a pair of uh, Patrick Ewan's gold and white with a gold and white. Uh, uh, sweatshirt and a farmer suit, you know what I mean? And a farmer hat, all that for $100, you know what I mean? So now I got $166 left. I went uptown to back up to Washington Heights where I got shot up, where I was robbing, uh, you know, the Dominicans and all that. And they scared to death. They thinking I'm coming up there to rob them, but I'm like, nah, I'm doing it different this time. I just want what my money buy. I got $100, 
You know what I mean? One dude tried to give me a whole ounce for the hundred dollars. I had to tell him, nah. You know what I mean? I ain't. You know, I, I don't need no handout. I want to do it the right way. I don't want you scared when I come back. You hiding and saying you ain't got nothing no more. You know, so you know, I wound up getting the little uh, three and a half grams, and I took it down to uh, uh, you know, to New Jersey. I put you know, because the book is based on you know, my life story. So I didn't want to put certain things exactly where it was at to change the location, but it was Jersey. I went out to Jersey, took that $100 worth of drugs. And from that $100 worth of drugs, I made $1,100 that night. In like five hours, I made $1,100 off of $100. You know, now it's like, whoa, you wasn't making it like that with weed. You see what I'm saying? So I had to go back uptown, take that, and I bought a whole ounce. You know, a whole half ounce now. So I get a half ounce and I go back down there. So now I got $4,000 in less than 12 hours. And I just came out of prison. I'm sitting with 4000 in my hands. And all I had was two hundred was, was $366. And now I got 4000 from $100 in less than 12 hours. Just as fast as it took me to go for, for, from Jersey back to New York to go cop. You know, so, you know, once I saw that, then it was like, man, I don't even want no money out of it. I just took all the money, put it in and bought more drugs and more drugs and more drugs until I had a key money. And then I had five key money. And then once I started buying, buying the five keys, they were like, yo, you keep coming up here too much, man. You buy five, I'm going to give you five on credit. So to cut down the trips, you keep coming up here. And then it was a wrap when they did that because now I got room to sell the keys whole. I could sell the five keys for, for, for 18000 that I'm getting for 10000 make 8000 off of each key. You understand what I'm saying? So now I just made 4000 from this one sale. You know, what, what, you know, I had to sell all this weed to do. And this is one sale. And then at the same time, I'm still breaking down the five keys that I brought. And off of that, I didn't take nothing off those five keys that I sold that I got on consignment. I took the whole 18000 from each one and brought it up there, and I gave dude his money. And I said, give me 10 more while I was still working with my five, you know? And I just kept doing it and pushing it. So I wasn't working for money. I was working for Coke. I spoke about that on uh, somebody else's platform. I don't want to give him a plug, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I spoke about that, and people say, oh, how he worked for drugs. Man, that's backwards. No, it's not backwards. Because, see, every year they got what they call a drought in uh, May, June, and in November and December. That's when they do inventory. When they do that, all the drugs come off the street. Once it come off the street, you know, they adding up all the money, and whatever drugs you have is the only thing being sold. So my, my game plan was I want to get all the drugs I can to hold on to. So when these droughts come for inventory in um, uh, May and June and November and December, I want to be the one, the only one with the Coke. Because I've seen Coke that I got for 10000 when it's a drought go to 40000 right in New York City. So my thing is like, man, next drought, I need to have my own 10, 20 keys. Instead of rushing the seller to just make the money and spending the money and, you know, and the back and forth. So I sold the drugs, you know, and when I, if I sold and I made 100000 and 50000 out of that was mine, I was taking a whole 100000 and giving it to them. I don't even want nothing. Just give me drugs. And as I sold that, I just gave them all the money to make, give me drugs. And then I know in May and June and November and December, I know that I'm going to be the only one with these 40 keys that's going over 40,000 that I got for, you know, for 10. So I'm making 30,000 off of each key at 40, 40 keys. You understand what I'm saying? And I've even seen it go up to 50,000 for a key in New York when it's a drought. Depends where, where, where they're coming from and how bad they want it to keep their spot running. Because when the price go up, when you're selling it, when it jumped from 10, from, from like 18, 20 in New York to 40, you know, People still got to run their spots. So that means now what they were selling for $50, you know what I mean? They might sell for $200 in order to make their money. And the fiends got to pay that extra price too during the inventory. So everybody makes their money over it. So the object is to accumulate the drugs. You don't want to have a store, just have the money in the bank from the store. You want the inventory, especially when you know the inventory is going to sell. You know the drugs is going to sell. Drugs is not going to get outdated like a pair of Jordans or, you know, a pair of Reeboks. You know, we say, man, if, okay, I got a sneaker store. I don't want to just stack up on all sneakers because you got to wait for people to come in and want to buy it. But drugs is the type of thing that everybody's coming to buy. 
You look fascinated. Go ahead, say something. No, <laughs> it, it it's crazy how you like. I'll have people that have gone to prison for many years for drugs, mm. and they don't know their market and the understanding like you do. Mm. And maybe that's because you've spent more time in prison to think about it, but you understood your market. Nah, I even have no more time to think about it. No yeah. prison. Prison had nothing to do with it. That comes just from knowing business. You know what I mean? Yeah. I couldn't read or write when I did all of this. I didn't learn to read or write till I got the ADX Supermax. You know what I mean? In 95, that's when I started learning to read and write. I didn't get my GED until 1998. You know what I mean? When I was 34 years old. So I was taught math. I I learned my triple beam scale before I learned my ABCs. I don't know what the triple beam scale is. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's the triple beam scale? <laughs> Damn. I, I don't know what that is. What, uh, I mean, maybe uh, I do. But. Uh, uh, you know what it is. A triple beam scale is a scale that had the beat, the weight on the beam oh, on this okay. side, beam on that side, and then in the middle is where whatever you put on it, it goes up and down and you weigh it from in the middle. So it's three beams, one, two, and one in the middle. That's a triple beam scale. You know what I mean? And those was the most complicated. So many people from my era still don't even know how to weigh them. They used to come to Coke spots and go buy Coke for me. And I'm talking about, you know, you go to some dudes and they'll, they'll put two lines over. So it's balanced at two lines over. You know what I mean? That's $20. And then they say they want 10 lines. So you put eight lines on the scale and it shows 10 lines because you got it balanced from two lines in. So these was way we call people that didn't know how to read a triple beam scale. Okay. You know what I mean? But, you know, you had to know how to read it to hustle or you'll get robbed like I just said. You yeah. understand? Just like the weed. We had dudes that were selling weed, right? One of the dudes, I, 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 I had to wet this dude up. You know, he played with me. I go buy some weed from him and he puts it on the scale and it was a pound. I take it back to go bag it up. You know what I mean? This is when our little nigga coming up. You know, I'm still selling weed. I go to go bag it up. And when I go to go bag it up and I'm going to go cut the weed up, there's little woodchucks in it. You know the woodchucks you see around the garden in the house? Yeah. He put little woodchucks in it. So he took out like an ounce of weed and cut up little woodchucks of an ounce to make it weigh the weed that he just took out. You understand what I'm saying? He thought you wouldn't notice? Yeah, because a lot of people would have just bagged it up and put it in a bag and dudes would have wanted them smoking the woodchucks and everything else. Or if they got came from too far, they would just took the woodchucks out, threw it out, and took the loss. You know what I mean? But these was the games that was played on the street. Uh, people gambled with their lives. So I know what I'm going to do with a dude for putting woodchucks in my shit. And I know what I'm going to do with a dude that's going to set the triple beam scale two or three lines over to only give me seven or eight lines for when I'm paying for ten lines. So I don't play them games because I know what I'm going to do. And I expect the next man to do the same thing I'm going to do because like Biggie Small said, you know, we all bleed. Yeah. So you know, you just love the art of business. You love the art of the deal. Like you loved that aspect of it. I and, feel like a lot of people misunderstand you mm -hmm. in that way too, just by like knowing your story and not understanding that part. Because the, my whole life is about business. Look like, like I, I love the business of YouTube. You understand what I'm saying? And I sit down and I just got the vid IQ on the thing. So I know how to put the tags in and the keyword generators. And I bet you there's so many people out there that have YouTube channels that don't even know what that is. Mm. You know what I mean? But I spend my money to buy that because this is technology, you know, and AI taking up. I got the AI app on my phone. Chat GPT. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Look, when yeah. I got it, uh, I could have got it for like maybe uh, four or five dollars, you know, a month. Or they offered it for seventy nine dollars for a lifetime. You know what I mean? All my friends said, "Man, just get it for the four dollars." I said, "No, why would I do that?" But I could get it for a lifetime. In 20 years, I can still use it for that price when they start charging you guys $80 a month. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to own it for the 80 now. And they're like, man, you're always thinking in the future. I said, what you want me to think about, the past? They're giving it to me for $79 for a lifetime or $4.95 a month. That's a no-brainer in the business world. 
So I'm not worrying about only spending $4.99 now, whereas instead of paying the $79, I got the $79. Let me pay the $79 and I'm secure. I never got to worry about it again. Any new updates they get is going to come on it and I don't never have to worry about paying for the chat. And the chat is going to go up. Just like Elon Musk said, they got all this thing out there to pick the numbers now and how to do this. They don't even take it for, for serious because there's so much, as Donald Trump introduced us to, fake news out there where they put fake propaganda to keep you blind and sleep. So so they tell you that Elon Musk is crazy. There's nothing that could pick a, a lottery number. There's nothing that could pick the stocks for you. This is what the, the media would tell you, to keep the poor people blind. But a real businessman, he know that the mind is capable of creating anything that you want. Everything comes from in your mind. Chat GPT, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter came from within a man's mind. Remember that. So if it came from the mind, that means it could be built or destroyed within the mind. So they try and keep poor people being workers so they don't want them to get a chance to get the, you, you know, the, the AI, pick the stocks that, you know, Elon Musk came up with <laughs> this one and that one. They tell them it's fake. And they don't know what to believe because they let the media tell them what to believe. When you could go up there and just make up any story, oh, I seen such and such having sex with a dog on 42nd Street. You know what I mean? And now you got 10 other people making videos that such and such having a dog on front. And nobody never seen it. Just one person put it out there. But they just run with it because they're too lazy to do their due diligence. Yeah. Now, do you think if if your brothers, say, had showed you another type of business— that wasn't drugs, you would have fell in love with that type of business too? And that's why to this day, and that's a great question, that's why to this day I don't even talk to my brother because mm -hmm. he was my older brother. I was a baby. Instead of him pushing me towards school, he pushed me in a drug house and closed the door and gave me a bag of weed and a nine millimeter. And to this day, I don't talk to him. I'm not mad at him because I'm proud of who I am now after going through those trials and tribulations. But I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy what was done to me to make me into the man that I am. He took me the long way, all the way around, with all the violence, ducking, getting shot up, going to prison, 26 years in prison, dealing with going to sleep every day with life sentence on my back, worrying about these people expect me to die in order to get up out of here. All that to get where I'm at right now in the chair. When he could have just put me in the right direction because he was older, so he knew better. And that's why my channel, Unique Maker Audio, I try and teach the youth, you know, and let them see, you know, the bull crap that I went through. You understand what I'm saying? So hopefully they make the right choice not to go through it. And that, that is very powerful, that's what you just said, because that's the problem right now. Mm -hmm. I think all these people that are, you know, even drug, you see all these drug dealers that like I, that went to high school with me or that everyone knows someone that's dealing drugs. They are smart. Mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. in a business way to some degree you know mm -hmm. imagine if they put that work ethic into something legitimate but that's what i'm saying but instead people tried to take the shortcut and they used other people to screw up their lives to make their short term you know cut valuable but like you said, if he would have just told me to go to school with the mind that I have, I would have. I might have been a doctor right now. I might have cured cancer already. Mm. You understand? Because the cure, everything is within our mind. Like I said, everything is in that 360 degree cipher. The same way cancer was in that cipher, the cure for cancer is in that cipher. And I know they have it, but they only give it to the to the rich. You know what I mean? Because that helped the cure the population, especially now, which we ain't going to get in it, but, you know, they they dealing with this uh, uh, Roe versus Wade, you know, getting turned over with the abortion, you know? So they saying, go have as many as babies. No, you can't kill the babies. Have the baby, have the baby. So they have to have something to kill off the population. You understand what I'm saying? And that's yeah. where these different diseases come in, that they have cures for, that they're saying they don't have cure. So they give it to the elite that's in a lane to be able to pay their taxes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Create jobs on the plantations, you know what I mean? Because Walmart is a plantation. CVS is a plantation, you know? Good thing, let, let me do this. Right? You got, you got when they was doing the tax thing, when Donald Trump came in and he was fighting to make the new tax law. You remember? First thing he did was change, you know, he made a new tax law where I think it was like the corporations pay 20% and, you know, you and me pay 33%. So for every dollar that we make, we got to give them 
You know what I mean? And every dollar a corporation make, they got to give them $20. And their justification in Washington for that was, you know, Donald Trump, because you know, he's, a, he's a brilliant man. He's brilliant. You can't take that away from him. You might not agree with what he does, but he's a brilliant businessman. I'm a businessman, so I study other businessmen. Donald Trump broke it down like this to sell it to the people. He said, look, all the companies and corporations are taking their jobs overseas. So they're taking them overseas and across the border. So... I'm going to bring the jobs back to make America great again. You understand? So he said, when I bring the jobs back, right, we're going to have to lower the taxes to make them want to bring the jobs back. And if we lower the taxes where they're saving more money, then they won't have to try and go outside the country to try and get the slave shop wages. You understand what I'm saying? Because we cut the corporation's tax down to 20% on a dollar. Then they could take that extra 13, 20% that they're saving by them only paying 20 and make more CVS, make more Walmart, make more ShopRite. You understand? To create more plantations. I mean jobs. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You see, but nobody even caught it. Now, they cut the day taxes. They... Still got the jobs overseas. They didn't bring no more plantations. I mean, jobs or corporations over here. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But yet, they only paying 20 cents on a dollar. When you busting your ass doing YouTube, giving them 33 cents a dollar, you know, off a thing. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Brilliant. And the people went for it. And they still don't know it. I hope they go look into what I just said. Why is a corporation paying less than you when they got way more money than you? Donald Trump said it best because they was going to put more uh, plantations, you know what I mean? So that, you know, Walmarts and all that, you know, because that's all they are. Those are big plantations. When you walk at Walmart and you see all these pretty girls with the nice little jeans on, their little blue outfits, you know what I mean? And then you see, you know, those are the ones that's the sale girl and then you see the cashier and then you see, you know, the, 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 the more masculine looking ones, they in the back pushing in the boxes and stocking the shelves. Those are the field workers picking the cotton. Unique, what Walmart are you going to that there's pretty women working uh, at the front? Because uh, not listen, in Connecticut, man. Now, uh, listen, I bet you if we go to the, I bet, listen, you know, you haven't paid attention mm. is what it is because you you're taking, I know okay. that's what it is. And I'm going, and I'm going to challenge you on this and then you make it live. You make a, a short. A video You know what I mean? It. There you go. I'm going to challenge you. You go to the local Walmart because I ain't got enough time to go with you today. And you walk through there and you tell me that you didn't see no pretty girls in there, you know, even workers are definitely the ones coming in, but they got pretty young girls in there that want to do the right thing. Pretty young women that want to do the right thing. But don't just look at them because they wearing a Walmart jacket and it's covering up their derriere and all of that. But really look at the women that work in there. No, the, I never pretty, judge by no, that. No, 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 no. I'm no, not judge. What I'm mm -hmm. saying is because you can't see the ass with the long, with the smock. That's why they have them wearing the smock. They mm -hmm. had them wearing the smock in prison. Guys used to masturbate to the females to jump into prison because we riding right now. You know, guys used to masturbate, you know, to the to the prison. First, it was only Cubans doing it. You know what I mean? And then, you know, then the, the younger black dudes that came in after us started doing it because we used to stab dudes up for doing that, disrespecting women like that. But you got dudes that sit there and they masturbate to, to the women. So when they started masturbating to the women, what they did is they wound up letting the, the females wear smocks because you couldn't stop a female from having a nice body. You understand what I'm saying? So when a girl is, and you know, she wearing a regular prison pants and she got her, you know, her jacket tied up, you know what I mean? Got her, got her pants and a shirt. And you see a little waistline, the fat ass and a nice breast and everything is form fitting. But she's wearing the uniform. No. But to us out here, you know, she's just wearing a uniform. But when you in there is unique 20 years without seeing a woman unless she went on a visit and some dudes don't even go on a visit. So when a female come in and they wearing their lipstick and they got their pants shirt and their pants and their ass looking like this, you got dudes that lose their mind and grab their joint and just start gunning, man. Yeah, they call them gunners. Yeah, right? it's all them gunners. When I was in gunners, the shoe. Gunners, Taliban, <laughs> yeah, assassins. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, they the, snipers, man. Snipers. The man. DC guys are notorious for that. I've met a lot of DC guys that would do that at the lows. Yeah, but I don't know about in the low, but okay. the DC men that's in the penitentiaries that I was in, they wouldn't allow their younger ones that you was meeting that had the short yeah. time to go do that. Because <laughs> if a dude from DC came in a pen and he pulled his joint out on a woman, the DC car is going to punish him. The, the police going to let the DC car know, yo, your man is this big and the women, da, da, da. so that's giving DC a bad name. And everything mm -hmm. is, you want to have your morals and principles intact. So you don't want 
the females looking and saying what you just said. Okay, so it's a young DC guys. We'll clear. It's a that new up. generation. Yes, yeah, yeah. a new generation. You have heard I don't that. know. You have heard that about the young DC ones. They're a little. They're a little wild. Mm-hmm. Not, well, to be honest, I didn't hear that about just the DC one. I heard that about the young black guys. Okay. Just in general, all, all across the board, not just from DC. You got guys from New York, Chicago, young dudes like the new generation. They feel it's all right to do that for some reason. But us old timers, we don't want that around us because at the same time, not only are we m- more maturing and we did disrespect women on the street. Let me just say that. And that's where the Snoop Dogg bitches ain't nothing but hoes and tricks came from. That's the era I came from. You understand what I'm saying? But at the same time, we wasn't raping no women either. Everything was consensual. So if you're going to sit there and pull your joint out and that's equivalent to raping a woman. Unless she say, yo, let me see that dick in your hand, you know, <laughs> you know, and, you know, then you and her got that understanding and that's a consensual sex. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Whether it's masturbation from a distance or whatever, like you're in a hotel with your girl and she tell you, I would lay down, let me see you masturbate. And you have a right to say yes or no. You tell her to do, she got a right to say yes or no. You know what I mean? But if you just out with a female and you just pull your joint out of your hand and start pulling, you know, that's disrespect. That's like raping because you're taking the, 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 the sex in your mind. You understand? Yeah. So us old time, we don't play that. Don't play that at all. Yeah. You know? So, you know, you get stabbed up, you go into penitentiaries. While I was there, I just came home in 2020, and I asked my homies, I'm sure my old head homies is not allowing them to do it. But when but when you talk about them lower securities where you was at, there's no old timers around them to school them. So they just came in as savages that generation, not just guys from D.C. that's young. You know what I mean? I'm talking about, you know, the dirty South car and all that. Like, I don't know if you know about the cars. Yeah. You man. know, so, you you know, where was you at? Was you up here down South? I was in Fort Dix and then I went to Danbury and then I got into trouble at Fort Dix because I didn't know anything about the cars. So I'm <laughs> sitting there moving around, interacting with everyone, trying to get businesses going and shit. Yeah. And they all thought I was a sex offender. <laughs> you see? And I didn't know anything about paperwork or nothing. Yeah. So I, when, I, when I go in there and I'm moving around, they're like, who the fuck's a sex offender running yeah. around? Because because I have that look, you yeah, know? Yeah, not because you yeah. look like an innocent white dude. Yeah, but they get taken advantage of. Like, no, what happens to day. an innocent white no, dude all in the day. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, look at your glasses and what you're wearing. So right there, that's the stereotypical sex offender look that we that they, that they we see getting arrested. Even you go watch a movie. I was watching a movie the other day. My man, uh, Wani, put me on where a uh, dude bought his son and daughter Lady came to the house, talked to me, bringing the son and daughter to, you know, to apartment to be models, to get the modeling career going. And when she brings them in there, when he brings them in there, he leaves it. It'd be done in an hour. When he came back in an hour, they was gone. They done kidnapped him and put him in the sex trade world. You understand what I'm saying? And then here goes the dude looking for his son and daughter, and he winds up tracking him down, but it was based on a true story. But even if you look at the guys in that movie or any movie that they have playing a sex offender, no disrespect, they look like you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, CD. No, but I'm just keeping it 100. And, you, okay. and that's why when you went there, you had that because the same way, you know, that's called, that's called uh, we know stereotyping, but they called it uh, racial profiling. Because like when we drive in a Mercedes Benz, you know, with BBSs and tinted windows and a flip flop paint down I-95, they always pulled us over back then. And then they fought drugs on us. But then it was the same thing. Whenever they asked the police, why'd you pull them over? He said, oh, because it looked like a black dope dealer car. So now you're racially pro and anybody got a Mercedes Benz with flip flop, bop, bop, bop. And they won that where they had to stop doing that. You know, racially profiling, meaning you got to get them because, you know, a tail light is out. He didn't use his blinker. He's speeding for a traffic violation, not just because he drive a car that looks like a drug dealer car or they can't pull you over and tell you that, hey, let me see your papers that you're not a sex offender right here in Danbury. He's like, what are you doing this? No, because you look like a sex offender. What's a sex offender? Clean cut young white guy? Because you had a few of them that did that. Now, anybody that wear regular rim face glasses and haircut is a sex offender. And that's what they did away with when it made always Supreme Court about the racial profiling. Because, and we was doing it because everybody did it. And they did it with you and Danbury. They labeled you a sex offender. So would you have looked out, out for me if you had met me on the yard? Like, say I roll in on the yard looking like me. What happens? No, I mean, first of all, I would have to see your paperwork. If your paperwork was right, no, I wouldn't let nobody do nothing to you. 
If your paperwork wasn't right and you tried to get around me, then I would have to smack the shit out to me for trying to deceive me and being a rat bastard. And a rat bastard is someone that don't stand on what they did. But somebody say, look, I got a sex offender charge. I just want to let you know da, 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 so that, you know, everything's in the front. Then I say, all right, well, cool. You stay over there. I'm good. You understand? Whether you're coming and say, nah, I'm here for a white collar crime. Woo, woo, woo. You know what I mean? And, and you know, I want a soup. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't get my package yet. you like a nice guy. I mean, you was kicking it. Da, da, da. I'll give you a soup. But if you're a sex offender and come and tell me you're a sex offender and ask me for a soup, no, you ain't got nothing coming. And what happens to the guy that says he's not, you give him the soup, and then you find out he is? Then you got to hit him because that's a rat bastard because you're deceiving me. Tell me who you are, then I know how to deal with you. Okay. That's it. Just tell me who you are. Like, people think that because I be hitting my channel saying, you know, gunshots to the flip-flop wearing rat bastards. <laughs> a rat bastard. I don't have nothing against somebody that took it for civilians supposed to do. And that's what I'm trying to get these people to do. Be civilians, man, so that you don't have to put yourself in a situation and tell on your comrade because you're not doing anything wrong. But if you choose to go on the streets, make sure you follow the rules of the game. And it's an ugly game and it's ugly rules. So ugly that I couldn't even tell on my own brother to get my freedom and he was dead. But that's the ugly rules. And then now you have people debating on YouTube. Oh, he's dead. He, nobody's going to jail. Nobody's dead. No, but you helping the police solve a case. Whether they're dead or alive, you just did the police's job. Period. So nobody have to go to jail. To be a rat is to get somebody indicted, you know what I mean? You know, and, 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 uh, and put in jail and convicted. So somebody got away with a murder and then you helped them get convicted, but they didn't go to jail so you didn't tell. But then now their kids got to live with the fact that it came out 20, 30 years later that their father killed somebody when their father got away with it. But somebody wanted to get out of jail, so he said, oh, his father's the one that killed this person. And this person been raised to think their father's the greatest thing than cook food. He was just a drug dealer, and he got killed in a drug deal gone bad. It's what he was raised. And then now somebody say, no, nah, but he also killed 10 people. And now this kid have to live with that. So you're pulling the Band-Aid off of certain things that should have died with the body. That's like I was watching the YSL trial, and... They asked the dude, Tick, I think his name was, that was just on the stand. They asked him um, about somebody that died. And he said, well, I don't want to speak on him because he's dead. And the court said, I respect that. The judge said that? Yeah, and they left it alone. Because you don't speak on the dead. Yeah, the person's not there to defend themselves either. Yeah, but, 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 but I'm just saying you don't. You let the dead rest in peace peace, man, in any religion, in any sane society. But nowadays, they took it to the next level where, you know, dudes talking about they smoking this person because he's dead to making fun. Man, that's not cool, man. Make fun of somebody that's dead saying you're smoking them. That's not cool, but that's how they choose to live. I mean, I can't choose them, but I'm here to let them know that, no, let their dead rest because we wasn't here to tell them so they picked up these other ways that's not you know righteous and they ran with it because we wasn't there because we dropped the ball and went to jail by the bad choices we made and that's why I always say that I apologize to my community for everything I did and that's why I'm doing my YouTube channel Unique Mega Audio to try and give back by saving somebody you understand what I'm saying yeah you're making a difference. You're making an impact. You know, it's the people with lived experience that the youth are going to understand better because you've been through that. You know, like a politician could go on and say, hey, don't do drugs. Don't do this. Don't do that. P kids take it with a grain of salt or anyone, you know. Mm -hmm. They see someone like you who's literally been fighting for his life inside a federal prison, the worst of the worst. That's got some weight to it. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's just crazy, man. But, you know, that's it, it's sad and it's sick. At the same time, because we dropped the ball when we fell doing that mandatory minimum and that crack law epidemic, we got tricked, man. And I'm man enough to say it. I got, as smart as I am, I got bamboozled. That's when <laughs> you, you got when you got arrested? Yeah, to, yeah, yeah to, to even sell the drugs to get arrested. Okay. You know what I mean? And I deserve to go to jail when I get got caught. 
How did you get caught? You know what I mean? Man, and that's the whole thing. I didn't even get caught. I didn't even, I've never been arrested for drugs a day in my life. You know what I mean? My whole thing was people told on me. You understand? And it wasn't even my comrades that told on me. You understand what I'm saying? These, these, you know, these are people that I took care of. You know what I mean? The very people that I took care of, bought them cars, houses, helped them get everything, helped them get their life together. Those are the ones that told on me. The ones that you would least suspect. And that's why now I don't trust nobody, man. Nobody. You know what I mean? They, no matter how much you give somebody, it's never enough, and they'll want to sacrifice you for them. One of the things that I was really, really fascinated about with your story is that when you got arrested and when you went before the judge to get sentenced, mm -hmm. and you got sentenced to what? Life in prison, right? Life with no chance of parole. What did you tell the judge when you got sentenced? Because I think that speaks wonders to your growth and— what you were able to become of yourself after prison too. Yeah. Now, when I got locked up and it was time to get sentenced, I just told the judge straight up, I already knew I had 330 kilos of crack cocaine that it was saying. It was powder, but they switched it to crack. Either way, both was life all the way. So I knew I was life all the way across the board, uh, category six for career offender and the whole nine. So, you know, I just told him, send me someplace close to the home so I could further my education. So if something come down the pike later on, I could go home and be a productive citizen. Prosecutor jumped up, called me every scumbag in the book, said, I think I'm going home one day. And no matter what, if they let me out 30 years from now, if they drive a spaceships, I'll figure out a way to do something illegal with the spaceship. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that haunted me for 26 years. So the judge sent me somewhere. He said, man, there's nothing I could do. You got too much drugs. Only way I could help you is if you work with the prosecutor and tell us who you got the drugs from. You know, he said, but and it's on the record. He said, and I know you're under no snitching code. I said, no, nah, I'm not under no code. You know what I mean? But I'm definitely not telling you nothing because that's your job to find it. All I'm asking you to do is send me someplace I can further my education. You know what I mean? He said, okay, well, you do that and you come back and see me. You know what I mean? So I said, well, just send me someplace close to home. He sent me to Lewisburg. I went to Lewisburg. They was trying to kill one of the homies there. And, you know, I jumped in and allegedly stabbed two police, riot and all this, wound up in ADX. That's where I met, you know, Larry Hoover, Matula Shakur, Juan Ramon Mata, um... Uh, 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 um, what's his name? Good man, Mario Villabona. You understand what I'm saying? That's where I met the, you, you know, uh, I met men, you know, and that, you know, fly that I just interviewed from D.C., um, Keith Gaffney, I think his real name is, but I met men, Dave Ford, and those are the ones that shaped me in the right way instead of, like, my brother in the streets did for their personal gain on the street. These was brothers that was already buried with time and they was trying to get me right so that I could get my life where it needed to be. And right now I'm one of them trying to get them where it need to be. You understand the youth I'm talking about. So then Donald Trump signed the thing in on um, the four, four things saying that the judge had the permission to reduce the sentence you know, if we could show we self-rehabilitated. And here I go. I got over uh, 100 certificates and awards. I became a certified electrician. All this is certification by the federal government, you know. Um, certified electrician, certified mechanic, certified HVAC and refrigeration, certified uh, culinary arts cook, you know. Um, I learned about the computers. That's how I was a little illiterate. I mean, literate when it came to this computer technology, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, um, I took 3,500 hours of psychological training to find out why I wouldn't tell on my own brother, he, even though he was dead, to get out of jail. Because I know that wasn't normal, but that was embedded in me. So I wanted to find out why. You understand what I'm saying? And from that, I learned, you know, um, you know, um, what they call that, uh, uh, cognitive, cognitive behavior therapy and, you know, all this letters and all this come with the alphabet. And I got my whole resume and everything. And I took all that, put it in a big priority box. It filled up a box like this on my accomplishments. And I took them same two pages of me and my judge talking when I asked him, send me someplace close to the home. And he said, there was nothing I could do for you. And it just so happened in the bill that Donald Trump signed, it said that, uh, if the judge wanted to help and he could couldn't help because of the mandatory minimum. Now he has the chance to do it 
if he solely choose. That means the prosecutor always get a chance to respond, but the judge makes the ultimate decision with the 404 that Donald Trump signed in. So I took those same papers and I put it just to him. I said, look, I honored my word when I came in front of you and asked you to send me someplace I could further my education. I started off bumpy. Yes, I, you know, allegedly stabbed two police. And yeah, I literally did a riot. But, you know, that was my first couple of years in. I was angry and, you know, I got myself together now and this is what I've done over the last 26 years. And I sent in that big ass priority box. And then I had a letter from the chief psychiatrist that worked with me to, for the 3,500 hours to find out why I was twisted to write a letter saying that she never met a man that had done so much self-improvement in her life and that she'll welcome me as her neighbor and that I've worked with a number of youth that went home and wrote back to the jail because I was in a program called Skills Program that says that, that said that, you know, because of me, they have their life together now and they, you know, they work and they, you know, they got their woman, they got a car and they no longer breaking the law thanks to, you know, them living with me in the cell. You see where I'm coming from? And there's something important to focus on here because there's a message underlying in here. Mm-hmm. There's two things. It's one, did you do all of those things because in your heart, in your mind, you believed that you were going to eventually make it out of there one day? Or did you do it because you wanted to become a better man and fix your past mistakes and be the person that you wanted to become? It it wasn't even about coming out because, like I said, I grew up in and out of jail. And, you know, and like I said, I already realized that the streets was a prison. I did all of that because— I wanted to show that no good prosecutor that said my life was scum and that I wasted my life and that I never amount to nothing that he was wrong. Even if you were going to die in prison. Even if I was going to die. I didn't care about dying in prison. You know what I mean? Because death comes to us regardless. I could die getting on a highway driving back down. Would I be mad? Hell no. (laughs) You understand what I'm saying? Because death is the only thing that's guaranteed to you in life. Now, the other part to this is that you wanted to prove him wrong. But in that process, and of I wanted to better myself. Let's get course. that right. Yeah, let's get that right. I knew I wanted to better myself. That's why I asked them. Oh, ho. first of all, I did it all for me. I asked the judge to send me someplace, you know, close to home, so I could better myself. Is how it all started. Because yeah. that's what I sincerely wanted. I wanted to try and do it the right way now. Because I done tried it twenty nine years the wrong way. So now I want to do it the right way. Now I got time where I got to sit still. I want to go to school. And they was giving grants in there at the time, this and that. I want to better myself, Your Honor. Send me someplace closer to home that got the best educational programs. That's how it started because that's what I sincerely wanted. I wanted and I got accomplished in my heart. But after I said that, the prosecutor jumped in to challenge me like, oh, he's full of crap. Whatever they do, he's going to this and he's going to that. And you know the crazy thing? I can show you when we finish with the interview. I went, when I came home, I went back down to his office and took a paralegal with me to make sure he didn't think I was coming out here to do nothing <laughs> to him. But just to look him in his face and tell him that, see, you was wrong about me. I like I'm a that. free man and look where I'm at right now. And I want to thank you for calling me a scumbag because that was the motivation for me to do what I was trying to do in my heart. Anytime I thought about quitting in 26 years because school got hard or I got tired of jailing or whatever, I always remembered you calling me a scumbag telling me I couldn't do it. What I want to highlight is that prison, they say the system is supposed to be a, re- a rehabilitative environment. No. You had to, I mean, I, I you could tell stories. I had to do it on stores. myself. I yeah. had to do that on my own. They but, didn't offer nothing. All of those <laughs> programs I took, right, over these 26 years while I'm doing all this, I kept putting in to go to a lower security jail so I could get better educational programs, access to them, because you get better programs, you know, and the mediums and the <laughs> lows could expect you to go out. But every program I tried to, every time I tried to get to a lower security, they kept bringing up, you got a kingpin charge. You, you, you allegedly stabbed two police. You started to riot. Man, that was 50 years ago. Then before you know it, it was 20 years ago. Before you know it, it's 25 years ago. And then that law came out. When I when they came to my door to tell me I was released, I thought they was coming to my door to finally send me back to a medium. When they asked me to give me an address, I thought they wanted my address to send me to a medium security prison. Wow. And he said, give me an address. And I told my pro my, my case, man, get the fuck away from my door. Cause he, you know, he he refused to send me, and when they forced it, when they when they ordered him to write the transfer, he wrote the transfer and didn't put none of my accomplishments in it just to make sure it would fail. 
So then here it is. I'm getting ready to go up for another transfer. So I'm telling them, get me out of his units. I get somebody going to do it the right way. So I was beefing with him about that. And one unit man just said, come down to my unit. I'll make sure that I write it up myself because you definitely deserve to be in the medium. You know? So um, while I'm waiting, two days after I had that conversation with him, my case manager, the little racist Mexican, come knock on the door and tell him, give me an address. I said, nah, I'm not giving you shit. I don't need you to do my transfer. Get the f- away from my door. And he said, no, nah, I need your address. I said, man, get away from my door. And I went and laid back down. He said, man, come in. So I laid back. I said, what? So he said, man, you were just released. He said, man, get away from my door. I'm thinking now he's telling jokes. I need your address to do your, your release papers. I'm doing life plus 20. I didn't even know the judge ruled on. I said, man, get away from my door. You know what I mean? And I went and laid back down. He went downstairs and got the, the email that he got and came up and he slid it onto my door. And I looked at him. My knees just started going like this. You know what I mean? Couldn't control him as I'm looking at it. And he's looking at me to see a reaction. So I just took it. I said, all right, now get the fuck away from my door. Wow. And as soon as he left, man, I fell right to the ground because my knees couldn't hold no more. It took every ounce of energy to be able to stand up. And I took a step towards going towards the, you know, the bunk. And you know how small themselves is. Banged my knees on the ground and hit my head on the side of the bed and said, thank you, Lord. All the prayers finally came through, man. You don't have to worry about me. I'm going to make sure I do the right thing for my people. I'm going to honor my prayers that I've gave you for 26 years. And that's what I'm doing now, Unique Mecca Audio on YouTube. You held that promise. I held it. Just like I held it to the judge. All I got is my word. Like you, I told you I was coming and what I told you. Don't never doubt me. I give you my word on something. I'm going to die before I let that word fail. Only thing I want on my tombstone is one word, honorable. What do you want your ultimate message to be to the people listening and watching this? That it's not worth it. You know what I mean? And that's coming from a man that made it to the top of the totem pole. I made it all the way to the top all the way to the top in the drug game. You know, I had a big million dollar club. You know what I mean? I, 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 I was instrumental in, 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 you know, rapping, all of that, getting a lot of the rappers out during the 80s and 90s in New York. I, you know what I mean? I done sold all the cocaine up, not just in New York, I'm talking about up and down the East Coast. You understand what I'm saying? I done had 30 cars. I done had it all, all the women, jewels. I mean, I had a house full of clothes. One house that I just kept nothing but clothes in. Every room was a closet. That type of living. You understand? Then when it got locked up, there was nobody to even go get the clothes out the house. All that was in vain. 98% of the clothes I never even wore. You understand what I'm saying? So the, my ultimate message is, cause like I said, I like to ride, but I stay on point. My ultimate message is that I don't want no one to have to go through what I go through, what I've been through. So I'm sharing my story and I'm being as honest, real and raw and sincere about it as possible so that anyone watching this that think that it's sweet to break the law and gamble with your freedom, know that Unique Mecca Audio was telling you it was not worth it, man. Five years I sat in ADX. Five years. 23 and 1. I'm tired, man. And I don't want my youth or my elders or anyone to have to go through what I went through. It wasn't worth it, man. And if they can't get that, go do what you want to do. Like I always tell them on my channel, if you feel you tough enough to do it, go do it. But I'm telling you not to do it. But if your dumbass think that you can handle it, when I'm sitting here as a prime example, that, that's like a man that died and came back and tell you that, man, they got fire in hell and they eating you and letting you still live where they eat your whole body, just your head, and you could just look and see the dogs eating you. And then you still want to go and put yourself in a position to go to hell. Then that's on you. Go to hell, my nigga. <laughs> you know what I mean? Go to hell. But I'm telling you, I've been to hell, and I'm back, and I'm telling you, it's an ugly ride, man. I don't want you to be away where, like I said, I went in, my daughter was 18 months. I come home, my daughter, 27 years old. I don't even know the woman. I can't even say young lady because I missed all the young time. Now I got to start all over trying to, you know, trying to meet her and understand her. And the thing is, you know, daughters don't, you know, daughters are selfish. You know what I mean? Daughters are selfish because they have such high expectations of daddy, which they rightfully are supposed to be. So I'm not saying nothing wrong with it. But daughters are selfish. Me and my sons get along because they kind of could understand my pain and they'll know when to just shut up and push back and don't say nothing. 
You know what I mean? But a daughter, they're so used to yang, 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 that they think they could come at you know, us after we've been gone for decades, man. I can't phantom what my daughter went through from she was 18 months till she was 27. I can't phantom it. So I would never make fun of it. I never criticize it. I never, you know, disrespect her about it. But daughters can't do the same for us that's been away. They say, no, but you was my father. You chose to sell drugs. I'm not going to have a conversation with you, but I chose to sell drugs and I put myself in jail. Because I'm telling you, yeah, I saw, chose to sell drugs. I put myself in jail. I did my time. I apologize. I'm here. Let's move from here forward and leave that I wasn't there for the last 29 years behind us. No, but I'm done and I'm gone. That's it. Because I'm not going to sit here and disrespect you, meaning my daughters, you know, or, you know, or, or, or fight with them. <clears throat> that, that's, I just leave it alone. When you, when you can have some empathy, like I have empathy for your struggle of what you must have went through while I was gone, because I don't know. You don't know what the hell I've been through while I was gone. So I, I emphasize with you, and now I just need you to emphasize with me so we can sit down to get a common ground and try and learn each other. Because we're both adults now, and we both got our psychological traumas from our upbringing, from mine's in prison, and then yours from me being in prison and not being there to be a father for you, to go to your ballerina class and take it to the piano class, you know what I mean, and take you shopping and have birthday parties with you. You understand what I'm saying? But we both have to emphasize. I'm saying it right, right? Emphasize. Emphasize. Yeah, because you know my accent kicking coming out, Jamaica. But, you know. That was we, a good one. Yeah, we, you know, we both have to, you know, emphasize with each other. Empathy, man, come on. 